Hey there, and welcome to You Talk. It's a show where we connect with people across Canada and ask them about their stories, cultures, and experiences. I'm your host, Ryan Funk. June 21st, the summer solstice, was National Indigenous Peoples Day. For centuries, Canada's Indigenous folks have celebrated the summer solstice. And on this day, we celebrate alongside them, recognizing the heritage and unique cultures of Canada's First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. Although June has come and gone, it's important for us to remember the challenges and triumphs of Canada's Indigenous folks year-round by actively listening and engaging in conversations with a broader community. We can work towards a future where all Canadians can have their needs met. We have interviews with two organizations that are helping out their communities in their own ways. The Native Association of Canada and the Mama Bear Clan. Let's get into it. Deloise Lorraine Whitman, grandmother white sea turtle and president of Native Women Association of Canada. I come to you from Mi'kmaq, unceded on traditional surrendered territory of the Mi'kmaq Ilmu people. What is the NWAC, the Native Women Asso uh, Association of Canada? NWAC is the National Women Association of Canada, you know, commonly known as NWAC. People usually use the acronyms NWAC. Um, it's an organization that represents the Indigenous women, girls, and gender diverse. And when I say Indigenous, uh, we represent the First Nation, the Métis, uh, and the Inuit uh, women, girls, and gender diverse community. We're a political voice um, of the of the Indigenous women, girls, and gender diverse people across Canada. Um, we've been in existence since 1974, um, and it's been uh, well known for the work that we do for the well-being of the people that we represent um, and equality of the indigenous uh, women, girls and gender diverse through advocacy, um, through education, through research and policy. Um, you know, we've been founded on a collective goal to enhance, promote and foster the social economic, cultural, and political well-being of Indigenous women within their respective communities and Canadian societies. Uh, for over 47 years, NWAC has been applying an intersectional, trauma-informed, culturally safe, gendered lens to support the needs of Indigenous women, girls, and gender diverse people. NWAC has established strong and lasting governance structures, uh, decision making, um, as well as the processes, uh, the financial policies and procedures and networks to help achieve the overall work that, that we do at NWAC. Um, and this is through the social economic, the cultural and the political uh, voice that we best um, work for our people. How did you find out about NWAC or, and why did you want to, uh, you know, join it and become, you know, a voice for many of these, uh, like indigenous women's? As a young girl, I had been a youth in our community and that's been well over 45 years ago. I always believed in speaking up and speaking for, for the truth um, and equality because there was a lot of racism, discrimination when I was younger, but it still is there. Um, and, you know, sometimes I wonder if it's even more because we have the technology, um, you know, the phones, the Internet, you know, uh, tweets and, you know, how we Facebook and how we communicate. But I've always believed in the rights. I've been brought up from a family of 14 children. Um, I have seven brothers, six sisters, myself being the, um, the you know, one of the seven daughters. Um, my grandfather uh, was chief of Bear River First Nation. My father was chief of Gluskap First Nation. 
um, and my sister was chief, and and presently my my younger brother is chief. So we've always been the political voice, um, you know, advocating, defending rights for our people and being brought under the matrilineal line of my mother um, her voice was very strong um, even though she was a very quiet woman whenever she spoke you heard what mm -hmm. she had to say um, you know she had been um, one that was brought up um, you know there was residential school um, there was a 60 scoop that my siblings were taken to so we've lived um, in many of these areas where you know, it hasn't been a, a good life, but you make it the best that you can and you never give up. So we've always been taught never to give up. And um, I always went forward, you know, working with the women, the girls. I myself had been in the political position as an elected counselor for 17 years. I worked in the education. Um, my education is in the field as rehabilitation practitioner. Uh, which I had, you know, gone to university and college for. And I always felt, and, and it's been stressed um, to us by our parents that education is so important. And of course, if you haven't your health, then you, you know, really haven't much because you need your health to be able to get out there and to, um, to advocate. It's so important to have individuals like yourself and your family advocating and working towards change because for so long indigenous voices have just been swept under the rug just just ignored even as we're seeing things uh, you know coming up in the news over the summer with these children that were uh, that were found it just seems to be a theme that people don't seem to take indigenous voices seriously you know we haven't been given the right at, you know, for many, many, many years. And, um, you know, it, it's so unfortunate that people who live in Canada, the Canadian, uh, their everyday Canadian citizen um, has now opened their eyes um, as we have, you know, found the remains of our children, you know, that have been buried. And now Canada is awakening, saying, what's happening here? How did I not know this? But, you know, if we open our ears and um, you know, sometimes our eyes to our heart with compassion and with love of one another. We would have heard that before, but mm -hmm. when it comes to children, people tend to think in a different perspective um, because we are protective of our children. And, you know, the way that we use our children certainly tells us um, how we are in the whole scheme of life with our, with our children and how a country's run. So... You know, the TRC has been out there. You know, um, the Honorable Marie Sinclair stated that there were remains of our children that were buried. Um, and many people didn't know about them being buried. But no one listened to them then. And they're just starting to listen. And those were recommendations in the TRC. So we are moving forward. And, and my heart and spirit goes out to the community members, to the families, as they find the remains of their you know, they're loved ones. Um, but in saying that, um, it's up to those communities how they decide what to do with the remains of the, the children that, you know, they find and whether they take them home to have a proper burial. Um, you know, it's up to them. Um, they're the ones that are hurting and, and healing. And yes, we hurt and heal um, for them and we're empathetic with the families, but it's up to the communities to decide how they wish to proceed with the remains. extreme capitalism, just climate change, all these things. The only way we're going to solve these problems is by working together, hearing each other's voices, becoming a united community, right? There's a large problem out there, um, you know, and we all need to be part of the solution. And we need to look at it in a respectful way towards one another. And we can't put the blame on anyone because blame becomes hatred. Then there's fear and then there it goes into, you know, more worse. And we don't want that negative energy out there. We want to have positive energy. We want to have hope for one another because, you know, we've looked and seen in history, um, it repeats itself. And in order for us not 
for this to happen to any other race of people, we need to tell the truth. We need to be transparent and truly know that there is a problem here and be open and admit um, that there was wrongdoings. And we need to proceed um, in that manner. And, and we can do it if we all work together. And that's not just governments, organizations, um, you know, businesses. It's the everyday person. You know, the teachers in school need to, you know, in our home, because where does prejudice start, if it not in the home? So we need to be able to educate, you know, our children and many people out there. Yeah. Um, I grew up in a rather conservative community, and it is just interesting. I will use that word. The propaganda <laughs> that is spread and kind of shared at a young age for people and it took me a long time to escape those those echo chambers and yeah. actually meet people and be like, huh, maybe that's not how the world works. Maybe the world is different. Maybe it isn't centered around this one aspect, this one sort of uh, culture uh, of people. But it's been great uh, meeting with different Indigenous-led organizations and peoples and just getting a new perspective on the world. We look at the uh, national inquiry into the murdered, missing Indigenous women, girls, and the two-spirited. Um, you know, and I see this as being like two I'd seen in that, um, you know, there had to be research done. Um, there had to be notes and, you know, there were and when I say stories or testimonies, their life experience that happened with the families and of their loved ones that have never been found. You know, there's some well over 50 years and more that have never been able to have closure with their loved ones. And I, I often think, oh, my golly, you know, you're wondering in your mind every night you go to bed. I wonder if she's OK. Where is she? Um, you know, I hope that she wasn't, you know, harmed or if she were that you know, she didn't feel much of the pain. Um, you know, these families, these mothers, these fathers, aunts, uncles, aunties, um, you know, they go through this. And, and I um, just think, you know, we need to have some peace, some solace. And the only way we can do that is open those, you know, close cases and, and try to find some justice there. You know, people just don't disappear. People aren't murdered. Uh, they don't don't do it. There's someone else that is out there and we need to have the truth. So, you know, that's a scientific component, but yet the indigenous women, uh, you know, the community members, they knew that this, you know, woman, girl or gender diverse, um, you know, person had been murdered, but why isn't anyone ever accounted for? So we knew that, but yet no one would believe us until a national inquiry um, had been taken with millions of dollars, you know, thousands of pages and testimonies, you know, experience the hurt, the pain. And that's where we're at now. You know, we're aching, you know, we're broken people because of it. And, you know, the government, the church has to acknowledge and, and certainly look at these issues because they're so serious. So many systemic problems that have, you know, just been festering for so long and with this inquiry when we're looking at um, you know missing and murdered indigenous uh, women and uh, diverse gender uh, gendered peoples you know has this inquiry and these conversations I know the government keeps making promises has there been a any change and how how can we protect these vulnerable people well, I haven't seen many changes. I know that, the, you know, the government has put out um, millions of dollars towards it, but we're waiting for it to see where it goes, um, who receives the dollars and how it's laid out. Now, we're, you know, we were supposed to have a national action plan, federal na national action plan uh, in regards to the um, murdered, missing Indigenous women, girls and two-spirited. Um, you know, there was a document that was released, but it wasn't an action plan. So we at NWAC had did our own action plan. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we had stated what needed to be done. We went through the, um, you know, the calls uh, for justice from the national action plan. Um, and 
you know, we put the objective, what we were doing, we cost analysis. So we put a cost to what we put a timeline when we wanted to complete it and, you know, follow up from there. But, you know, we haven't seen any of that yet, um, you know, with the government in those areas, although we at NWAC, you know, we're doing it, even though we didn't have the dollars, but um, we can't blame the pandemic for everything. The pandemic certainly has been a crisis with the um, with the women because the violence increased um, at the very beginning because people were isolated in their own homes and they couldn't go elsewhere. So they're living in the same home as their perpetrator. Um, and it may not just be the, the woman, but there's, you know, we know that, you know, the housing are overextended and there's, you know, extended family members, uh, grandparents are living in the home uh, with their grandchildren or great grandchildren. So not only are the women abused, but the grandparents are as well. And then you have the children that are listening to the abuse or seeing the abuse that's occurring. And this also you know, is going to have effect on these children. And again, it's going to be trauma that's going to go into intergenerational trauma. And we are already living with that, you know, from the uh, residential schools, the 60 scoop and discrimination of all sorts and systemic, you know, in the healthcare system, the justice, it goes on and on. So, you know, it's, it's really difficult. Um, but we at and WAC as being one of the largest national um, organizations in Canada should be at the table with the government speaking for the needs, not the wants, but the needs that need to be there for our women and our girls and our gender diverse community um, to be able to speak on their behalf and to have input into it. What are some other programs and initiatives that NWAC is, is working on? Are there any projects or plans uh, in this in this year? Certainly. Um, you know, we've been working on a numerous, um, you know, of projects and what have you, um, at, you know, at NWAC, especially with the pandemic. Um, you know, we have, um, I'm just going to read something. I'm just going to put the phone down. Hey, okay, no worries. No worries. All right. It's just that I just want to get it correctly because there's so many um, mm -hmm. things that are happening, you know, in NWAC. Um, so, you know, one of the most ambitious initiatives um, that we have at NWAC is the, and we're incredibly proud, you know, of what this is. And it's our Resiliency Lodge program. And you may have heard of it in the paper, the news, you know, we have spoke about it. Um, as well. So, it, you know, it's been out there. Um, so it's shortly after we launched our first uh, virtual resiliency lodge programming. It's to provide support across the country during COVID-19. The overwhelming response from both in-person and virtual programs has resulted in the rapid growth of these programs. We have had well over 10,000, if you can imagine that, 10,000 participants in virtual workshops and in getting ready to open the doors of our second Resiliency Lodge, which is happening in New Brunswick with the Willistock um, Homelands. So, you know, this is really exciting for us um, at NWAC because this is part of our calls. Um, you know, we need wellness, health, and this is a truly a part of our healing. So we also have a number of other ongoing programs and initiatives that are core to NWAC's mandate. Um, we have Beat the Drum. Now, many of these you'll be able to see on our site at NWAC, nwac.ca, um, you know, to go in and further educate yourself and get a better understanding because it's, what I'm saying is just a brief over view of what we're you know what we're discussing so it's beat the drum it's our entrepreneur outreach and navigation program you know it saw the growth in the past year with the addition of the indigenous women's business directory and increased workshops offering to support indigenous women and girls and 2LS LGBTQ QIA plus entrepreneurs 
We also launched Restoring the Circle last year as an e-learning program that provides trauma-informed and culturally safe training for series providers working with the 2S LGBTQ QIA plus Indigenous people with living experience of gender-based violence. And, you know, these are so important. And why I say that is because, you know, we need to work for everyone. And then that's what we're doing. Uh, we're doing the best that we can to be open and transparent, you know, for all genders, regardless. So there is so much to be proud of um, that these really are just a handful of, you know, of many of the initiatives that NWAC has launched. Um, we're looking forward um, into, you know, 2022 and beyond. Uh, there are two initiatives that we're very excited for that's happening. Um, the first one is upgrading our existing platform, Safe Passage, which is a national database dedicated to missing, murdered Indigenous women mm -hmm. and two-spirited, educating tools and data collection. Over the next year, we will be we will work to update this data, including increasing capacity of our existing MMIWG 2S. Uh, self-reporting tool. Um, the expansion of this data will help increase accurate collection on MMIWG um, cases and further answers to call for justice. Um, Natica will also be opening our social and cultural innovation center this year, which will be it, the cultural hub for Indigenous women and 2S LGBTQQIA plus um, people that supports economic resiliency and the site of NWAC's national office. Um, I'm very, you know, excited for this to be able to, you know, soon be open, and we're looking forward um, to what. 2022 has in store for us. So those are just a few of the initiatives uh, that we've been working on. But, you know, adding to that, um, you know, every every single action makes a difference. Um, you know, we can talk about words, we can write it down, we can have reports, but many of these are put on a, on a file or they're in, you know, put on a shelf to add dust. But we need to put these words into action. So every little bit of action that we take makes a difference. Um, so, you know, whether it be long term or short term, um, in order, you know, to send um, an ongoing, to, to be able to end this genocide, you know, of the missing murdered Indigenous women, we need to have action, we need to have sustainable funding, and we need to work collaboratively, um, not as just as partners, you know, government always uses the word partners. You know, uh, we need to reset the partnership. You know, we're partners. Well, you know what? I want an ally. We need allies, people that are true to the word, that are on the same uh, topic that we're on. They're going to be there so that we come to the end. It's almost, um, if I can put it in this term, um, you know, you're, you have, you know, the government on one. And this is a partnership. This is how I see it. Um, and they're in their black escalade beside a river. Um, and they're on a paved road. We're all going down, you know, five kilometers. I'm in the water, in the river, in my canoe. Black escalade here on a paved road. I'm on a canoe in the water. We start at the same time. The black escalade reaches there within seven minutes. I'm portaging. I'm paddling down the canoe. I come to rapids where I have to portage. I get out of my canoe. I go up into the woods, go around those rapids and those white waters to get to the other side. It's in July. The mosquitoes are thick. I'm sweating. I'm hot. I'm getting thirsty. But I don't have water. I need to get to the end. I get back into the water and I start paddling again. I'm hot. The bugs are still with me. And then we come to a waterfall and you can hear it roaring. So I need to get to the bank and I need to 
portage again, but this portage is a lot more larger. The barriers, the thickets are there, there's thorns. I go out and around and then I come back down to clear waters and I come back into the river again and then I portage. And it has taken me over five hours to get to the end where we're to meet. So that partnership isn't of equal ground, but an ally is when we start, both of us in the river, in our canoes, and we go down that river together. We both are canoeing. We go and we portage. We meet all the barriers. We're thirsty, the bugs, the thickets, and the trees. And then we go back in. That is an ally to me, is going all the way with those barriers and challenges that we both face not just one group of people facing all those challenges by themselves. Mm -hmm. So when I say, um, you know, I want to, I'd like to see an ally out there. That's what I'd like to see is an ally doing exactly what I do. Yeah. The, the late, like when you're using partnership as, as the wording, it's very business and legal language. It's not on that emotional or personal level that we need to get to, to work towards reconciliation and true unity in this country. Yes. Yeah. And that's what it is. And, you know, people, you know, we always have these theme words. We had, you know, TRC, National Inquiry, partnerships, um, you know, and we really need to look at the language that we use because each word has such a strong meaning and it may have a different definition to the person that um, you know is receiving it at the other end and and i truly feel that now we need allies and and we're seeing um you know in other countries you know with, with what's happening now with russia um you know and now we're seeing you know um the, the countries coming together and working as, you know, as allies. And if they can work with other countries as allies, why are we not able to work within our own country with the people that live here, the first peoples of the land? There's a real othership that, that has kind of accumulated and cultivated within modern society. You have one group of people here, one group of people here, but... We need unity. We're we're all we're all a unified family. We're we're all humanity, right? Exactly. And you know, Canada is a diverse country. We have many, um, you know, we have different religions. We have different race, people of color, um, and you know, we need to work together and embrace. You know, when I look back hundreds of years ago in my territory of Mi'kmaq, you know, we embrace the British, the English. Um, but we never ever anticipated because we never had the ownership of land. We used, you know, the land for what we needed today so that there would be more there for tomorrow for our generations. But um, the way it is today, um, we go in and we rape Mother Earth and we take everything because of this greed. Mm -hmm. and, and we never had that. You know, we shared. Uh, whatever we had, we would share. And that's why the midwinter feast is so important, you know, to us, because we gathered, you know, um, our foods in the summer, you know, we would uh, dry them. And then, the, you know, in the mid of winter, when it's getting over in February, we would all come together because we've been in our own little areas for so long, uh, because of the bad winters that once, you know, occurred. Then we come together, we take our provisions that we had, we sing, we drum, we dance, we feast, we tell stories. And, you know, we're there in love and compassion. Um, and that's what we need to, to, you know, to continue doing. Lorraine, it was an absolute pleasure talking with you, having these great conversations. Where can people go to find out more about NWAC and the work you do? If you... Um, go on our site, um, NWAC, nwac.ca. Um, you can look in the President's Corner. And when you look at the President's Corner, um, it'll say what I do every month. I put a monthly edition out. 
um, and it'll give you what I do. You'll also see our CEO report, uh, Lynn Grew, and she, along with myself, we work, uh, you know, like two peas in a pod. And, um, you know, we work, you know, diligently for, for our women, for our community members. And, um, you know, you can read her report. Um, and it'll give you another initiative, our workshops that we've done and, um, you know, what the women deserve, you know, they, their voices need to be told. And although I'm the political voice, we need to hear from the grassroots people because their voice is so important. And I wouldn't be where I am if it weren't for them. My name is Grace Akerstream Lang. I'm the coordinator of Mama Bear Clan out of the North Point Douglas Women's Center. Um, and I've also lived in the North Point Douglas area for about 20 years now. Um, so yeah. I know Tara is, you know, when I've talked with her, she, she says like the North End is really nice and there's a really close knit community living there. Yeah, there is. Everyone's kind of, we all have like a good relationship with our neighbors, which is really nice. Because, you know, there's so many stereotypes, like when you hear people within Winnipeg and even like specifically outside of Winnipeg, like, oh, the North End is so scary. It's like, I think that's just, you know, where pe more lower income families live. That's just a little bit classist right there. Exactly, yeah. How long have you been, uh, you know, involved as the coordinator for the Mama Bear Clan? Um, so I've been the coordinator for about two years now. How have you been enjoying it? Um, it was good. I started in the middle of the pandemic. Um, so as things are opening up, I'm still like learning so much more about, you know, different community events. And um, so it's been fun. I love it. It's honestly more than what I could have imagined. I'm so happy, you know, being the coordinator and just being a, a strong support for our members and our, our captains and the community. It's It's great. Let's just jump right into it. What exactly is the Mama Bear Clan? So Mama Bear Clan is a foot patrol safety group in the North Point Douglas area. We are led by women and supported by our, our men. Um, we patrol three times a week, Wednesdays and Fridays from six to eight and Sundays from four to six. All of our patrols are about two hours um, and what we do on patrol is we, we hand out food. Typically we hand out about a hundred meals um, and we just pull it in our, our wagon. Um, and whenever we get donated, um, we pick up sharps. We, you know, if a woman or someone needs uh, to be walked home, we'll walk them home. Um, we pick up needles. We check on people living in homeless encampments just to make sure that, you know, they have everything they need. We do wellness checks. Um, we attend events, vigils. Um, we kind of, we're all over the place. We do a lot, so it's kind of hard to narrow down, but mm -hmm. but for the most part, um, we're out there three, three to four times a week, you know, just checking on community. It's really cool to hear about, you know, these women run um, groups and organizations working to, you know, improve our communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's important, you know, and it's, it's very, just being surrounded by such powerful women in itself um, makes Mama Bear Clan what it is today, so. Mm -hmm. uh, are you familiar with the history of it at all as, you know, when it was established and why? Yeah, we started in 2016. Women's Warrior Circle reached out to the Bear Clan and brought along Mitch Bourbonnet and Karen Thomas. Um, and from then we, you know, we started Mama Bear Clan. It was all because of the Women's Warrior Circle. What can you tell me about the Women's Warrior Circle? So Women's Warrior Circle is a drum group out of the North Point Douglas Women's Center. Um, they, they meet every Thursday at the North Point Douglas Women's Center um, from 6 to 8 p.m. And they do, they're kind of like a woman empowerment group. Um, so they do drumming every second Thursday. They have sharing circles, um, you know, they, and they also go out to community events and drum there. Yeah, that's something I've been learning about, you know, the significance of drums within Indigenous cultures and communities. It's very fascinating. Mm -hmm, it is. So powerful. You mentioned a little bit about what Mama Bear Clan uh, does, but you know, what are some other ways that 
You know, we can all work together as a community to, you know, improve the safety of our neighborhoods. Um, I would suggest, you know, going out and um, just doing walks around the community, looking for, you know, sharps, needles, anything that could be a hazard to community, to dogs, to kids, um, and just getting to know your neighbors. That in itself creates a sense of safety when you can trust and you can rely on your neighbors. As these groups are wandering around looking, you know, providing community safety, it must be uh, very eye-opening about, you know, a lot of the systemic challenges and problems within our, uh, our systems that need to be addressed. What would you say are some of the most, you know, uh, most significant things that, you know, that you see that we can work on together? Probably, you know, obviously Winnipeg has a very bad housing crisis. There are a lot of homeless people in Winnipeg um, that are in need of, of help. We've seen it through, you know, minus 40 with people camping outside through the pandemic. And, you know, with the shelters closed at that time, like people were, were struggling very hard. Um, and I think a good a good way to help that and to do something to contribute to that, not to give into the stigma that homeless people are, you know, bad people or they are criminals or they're alcoholics or, and just kind of opening your eyes to that they are people, they're good people. We have built relationships with them. I've grown to love some of them. Um, and helping when you can, whether it's having a few water bottles in your car to hand out, um, toilet paper or you know and also getting involved with mama bear climb with groups that are going directly into these camps and that are helping there's such a stigma uh towards the homeless people like oh they're dangerous they're scary Mm -hmm. and you know in some circumstances when desperate when someone's desperate enough yes some things can happen but these are people that one like myself could easily fall into a situation like that. My my luck was bad, or my situation was mm-hmm. just slightly different. Those are people that you know they could be us. So of course we need to help them out. And every person's a person. They they deserve dignity. Yeah, exactly. That's great that Mama Bear Clan is working to help help these communities as well as reduce uh, the stigma around there. People could join, join up with Mama Bear Clan. Is there any like financial donations or things like that that can uh, help out? Yeah, um, so we do accept donations. Uh, We accept e-transfers, cash, um, and you can also donate online through our website. Um, So our website is npdwc.org under the Mama Bear Clan tab, or you can go under the donation tab. And some items that we accept are, you know, it really depends on the season. But throughout the winter, we accept any winter gear, uh, blankets. We're always accepting socks. We don't accept clothing, uh, but we do accept, you know, warm items such as, you know. Blankets or. Yeah, blankets, anything that can help someone. Say if you're camping, what would you need when you're camping, right? Oh, yeah, like a sleeping bag or things like that. Toilet paper, um, wipes, any hygiene stuff. um, And also, you know, granola bars, bars. water bottles, and uh, any snacks, anything like that would really go a long way. Uh, that's so cool. What, what sort of um, response do you get from the community uh, in terms of just the Mama Bear Clan? Pretty good responses, I would say. <laughs> um, so we're, we're involved with, you know, if there's ever like a community cleanup, we kind of come together and, and sponsor that. Um, Recently, there was an abandoned encampment that was on in our community on Rover Avenue. Mm-hmm. Um, we ended up, you know, phoning 311, but 311 wasn't able to get it cleaned up in time. And obviously, with how high the river has risen in the last few days, we wanted to get it cleaned up before that. Um, so we came in with our, our PDRC group. It's a residence committee in Point Douglas, and we cleaned mm-hmm. it all up. And the amount of people driving by and just saying, thank you, like, you guys are amazing. Like, it was so uplifting to hear. Um, And just being able to be a support in the community with, you know, providing food. um, I'm not sure if you're aware, but Point Douglas is considered a food desert. We don't have any grocery stores. 
there's there's one convenience store um so that's a huge huge you know accomplishment for us to be able to provide food to community whether it's yeah. just a sandwich a granola bar just having something to offer people is very important yeah i was uh not aware of that uh mm-hmm. that is good knowledge to know yeah that that really shows you know part of the neglect in terms of uh, city planning of that area. Yeah, definitely. Because people need food. They need access to food. And if you put it far away, especially for some people with in low income, like that's, that's ridiculous. The closest uh, grocery store is, is no frills and it's about a 30 to 40 minute walk from the North Point Douglas area. So it's, it's definitely concerning for, you know, our elders in the community. Um, and which is why, you know, having North Point Douglas Women's Center is such a great thing to have. Well, exactly. Yeah, we give out hampers, like we, we try our best. Um, so it's important. Yeah, it's like the only, like a cornucopia um, <laughs> in this whole area of no, oh, that's, that, that's, that's really mind boggling uh, for me just hearing that. Yeah, yeah, it is. Well, thank you so much, Grace, for taking this time to tell me a little bit about this really amazing group of people working to um, improve the lives of people within their community. Is there anything else that you would like to share about the Mama Bear Clan or at least, or even the North Point Douglas Women's Center? Um, I would just like to share about the Women's Center because we do have a lot of different programs um, that, you know, speak to a lot of different people. So if you're ever needing support in any way, whether it comes to counseling, we offer free counseling. Um, we do give away hampers, we give away baby supplies if needed. Um, and we also have, you know, different workshops throughout the year. We have Red Road to Healing, which is run by our knowledge keeper, Gladys Marinko. We have a grief work workshop, um, which focuses on, you know, helping people get through uh, their grieving process. Mm -hmm. And, um, we have a creating our bundle workshop coming up in May, which teaches, um, you know, indigenous parenting styles, indigenous birthing styles. Um, the woman that is facilitating this workshop, she's an indigenous doula. So we have a lot of stuff going on. So if you're ever interested and just, you know, getting to know your community and seeing what's out there, or if you'd want to donate, um, just check out our website and see what's going on and, and come by to one of the, the workshops. Mm-hmm. And just to kind of wrap things up, Grace, what is, uh, what is the, uh, the best way to get in contact with Mother uh, uh, Mama Bear Clan or North Point Douglas Women's Center? Um, probably by calling or emailing. Um, so our number is 204-947-0321. Um, and you can call or talk to the drop-in staff or if you'd prefer email, um, that's also on the website as well. Or we do also have our Facebook Messenger, which you can message us on Facebook if that's the easiest way for you too. Enjoying the content by You Multicultural? Why don't you subscribe to stay up to date with everything that we're doing. I'm Ryan Funk. This was Utah and have yourself a good one.